All right, breaking overnight, CNN has obtained this internal memo circulated by House Republicans outlining the four main points Republican lawmakers plan to push to defend the president as the impeachment inquiry goes public tomorrow. I want to bring in Jeremy Diamond, CNN White House correspondent, and Jennifer Rogers, CNN legal analyst and former federal prosecutor. And I will always issue this disclaimer, I'm not a lawyer, but I don't think I need to be one to be astonished by how weak these four main assertions are mm -hmm. by the congressional Republicans here. Number one, the July 25th call shows no conditionality. Well, you don't need conditionality. You only need to read the president pushing or coercing the leader of Ukraine to investigate the Bidens. Plus, mountains of evidence suggest there was conditionality well known and implied over the two months of the summer. Zelensky and Trump said there was no pressure on the call. Donald Trump, not a reliable witness in this case. And Zelensky, not either. He needs the United States as an ally. The Ukrainian government was not aware of the hold of aid on the July 25th call. That may be true. However, they were aware into August, and also they were aware that a meeting was being held up by the two leaders. And number three, the secure, uh, four, the security hold was lifted on September 11th. Yeah, after the White House knew about the whistleblower report. Now, I've been looking at this, Jen, and it is the most comprehensive defense that Republicans have issued. That in and of itself is interesting, and they have some interesting evidence and arguments here, but if those are their four main points, they don't have a lot to argue. Yeah, I agree. I mean, as we were discussing earlier, to me, it seems like what they're really doing is more saying, you know, uh, listen, the Mueller uh, report kind of collapsed upon itself because it was too complex, too complicated, too many facts, too many different tangents. I think they're trying to do the same thing here, right? All these witnesses are testifying. Each has a different view, is bringing different facts to the table. The more they can throw out there a bunch of different facts and, well, you know, that's not true. This other thing is true. We're worried about corruption. We're worried about all this stuff. It kind of complicates and muddles the narrative, which had been very simple at the start. I think that's part of what they're doing here. I think it's also part, uh, partly about making it all about the call. And this is where I think it's interesting because President Trump and Republicans are kind of on the same page now for once, which has not always been the case throughout this impeachment proceedings. I think Republicans, and I've heard this from my Republican sources, from White House officials I've talked to, uh, think that the call is less damaging than the overall pressure campaign uh, that took place over months and months and months, which is, again, a lot harder to understand by piecing together the testimony from different witnesses versus saying, okay, but maybe you can interpret the call this way, right? Um, and the other thing that I've heard from Republicans is that you don't have, as of yet in this testimony, direct evidence of the president telling one of his officials, we are going to carry out this quid pro quo involving security aid for Ukraine and the pressure for this investigation, right? Even Gordon Sondland, for example, says, I presume that this was the case. Uh, we haven't heard yet from Rudy Giuliani, of course. We haven't heard yet from Mick Mulvaney. And so that, I think, is a big part of this. We do, uh, however, latest. have the transcript of the call, right? right? We have the loose <laughs> transcript of the call, you which was the, the first piece of evidence we got here. Um, and the president says, do me a favor. A and then he later says, uh, there's a lot to talk about Biden's son, that Biden stopped the prosecution. Talk to the attorney general. That would be great. But Republicans will argue that is open to interpretation, whether that is a quid pro quo, whether that is direct military security assistance. I, I, just, I understand case. they'll make that and case, but you don't necessarily even need a pre quo quo to make the case that you are coercing a foreign leader to do something. It's also interesting, too, though, because it speaks right to what we know is the way that the president does business. And we mm. know this from Michael Cohen and we know this from repeated officials is that, well, they will point to it and say, we, he, I didn't do anything directly here. And as long as there's no record of me, President Trump, telling Rudy Giuliani to do this, my hands are clean. Yeah, and of course, you know, the reason that we don't have that evidence is that all of the people who are holding that evidence inside of them are refusing to testify because the White House is stonewalling. So, you know, that's part of this as well. And they're going to have a big obstruction count in the impeachment articles, but it's still not as good as getting that evidence of it coming from well, I will say now. we do have tweets from Rudy Giuliani saying that everything I did, all of my behavior was on behalf of the president. So there is that evidence. Meanwhile, we're waking up to this reporting in the Washington Post. The New York Times has a version of it, too, of disarray inside the White House just hours before the public impeachment hearings. Infighting, let me read you part of this. The White House's bifurcated and disjointed response to the Democrats' impeachment inquiry has been fueled by a fierce West Wing battle between two of President Trump's top advisors and the outcome of the messy skirmish 
could be on full display this week, according to White House and congressional officials. This has to do with a fight between the acting chief of staff and the White House counsel's office. Yeah, and, and, and this is something that we've borne out in our reporting as well over, over weeks and weeks. Uh, this has been a consistent theme in this White House during this impeachment proceeding, that Mick Mulvaney and Pat Cipollone, the, the White House counsel, have not been on the same page. Uh, and there are, a lot of this is fueled by Mick Mulvaney's uh, press briefing room appearance, where he admitted to a quid pro quo for the entire world to see before attempting to walk it back. Um, and there's also been some frustration with uh, Pat Cipollone, who, again, is focused kind of on the legal strategy of this, and he has kind of siloed off a lot of what he has been doing, like the review of the circumstances around the call, kind of piecing together doing this internal review. He has kind of kept that to himself, not necessarily shared it with the messaging side of the White House. That has also provoked some frustration.